Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here with me today. Today, my guest is Justin Perkins, who is a mastering engineer who owns Mystery Room Mastering in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And in this interview, we get into some really great detail about the process of mastering. And I know for a lot of people, mastering is often seen as this dark art that people don't really understand what goes into it. Most people know about the audio portion of it, but a lot of people think that that's all it is. Or in many cases, some people don't even know what mastering is at all. So in this episode, we get into a lot of depth about the mastering process, what goes into it besides just the audio side. We talk about mastering DAWs. We talk about how to set up your sessions for mastering. We talk about how to record your audio in the best way possible as far as selecting the proper sample rates, bit depths, uh, when, when and where you should be using things like dither, a whole bunch of great stuff. In this episode, I think Justin is going to help clear up the process of mastering for a lot of people. So I know that you're going to find this episode very helpful. So let's just jump right into it. Justin Perkins, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. I've been listening to some of your uh, previous episodes and I really enjoy the the podcast, you know, the content, the production. It's ver- very well done. Amazing. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. For people who might not be familiar with who you are and your background, can you give us a little bit of that story in terms of how you got started in music and ultimately to where you are today? Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's a very similar story to a lot of other people my age and demographic. And I've done plenty of other podcasts. If anyone really wants to hear the long version, you know, working class audio and all that. But you know, basically, I was um, got into music very young. You know, I was born in '81. My fifth grade teacher um, got me very into the Beatles. He got our entire class into the Beatles. He would bring his guitar in on on Fridays to end the week and sing Beatles songs. And my dad was very into music, and my parents had gotten me a guitar, a little cheap acoustic guitar. But um, that fifth grade teacher really kind of got me going and really excited about music and. Also, what happened was Nirvana's Nevermind came out around that time. I think I was about in fifth grade. And basically, I don't know um, how old you are, but people from that era might remember music in the 80s was really very kind of, I don't want to say overproduced, but very synthesized and hard to really like, it never occurred to me to make music because it just sounded so over the top and reverb and computers and synthesizers. Uh, When Nirvana came out, it was like, wow, this sounds just like, really simple guitars, drums, bass. You know, I think, I think we, me and my friends could do this. So we started a band pretty young, you know, sixth, fifth grade, sixth grade, playing in bands. Um, you know, at the time, you couldn't just go to Best Buy and get a laptop and have a studio. Um, you had to, like, book a studio, and we didn't live in a big city. So we kind of ended up, uh, basically, I just learned how to record on a cassette 8-track that we rented from the music store. And uh, next thing you know, other friends and bands are asking me to record them. And I, I never wanted to be a recording engineer. I didn't even know what that was or a producer or anything like that. I just kind of got into it that way. Just people asking me to record <laughs> their bands, you know. And then as you get into high school, then there's way more people to network with. And then other high schools regionally. So it just kind of grew from there. Um, we always had bands, even going, like I said, going back to middle school. So that's a great way to meet other bands that need to record. And that's, I didn't know it at the time, but I was growing my network and creating a network and just kind of organic reach. You know, this is well before email addresses and social media. It was all like being at shows, telephone calls, voicemails, not even texting, you know, this is like the nineties. So um, that's basically a, a quick version is just getting into music young, playing in bands, um, being the one person that paid attention when the guy at the music store showed us how to work the A-track. <laughs> I became the engineer. Um, and I was never a technical person. I would never take things apart and fix them or anything like that, and I'm still not that way, but I just kind of got into it out of necessity. So where did the mastering portion of it come for you? Uh, that came a lot later. Um, well, it's weird. It came early. Initially, it came early, again, by necessity, and then later, um, I eventually graduated to moving out of my dad's basement, and I got, I was able to record at a, one of the great rock and punk rock studios in the area. Um, it was known for having, like, the, 
as soon as you put in a CD, you could tell within three seconds that it was done at the studio because it just sounded great. And then luckily I was able to work there and it was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And was this Smart Green Studios? Bay is, uh, it's called Simple Studios. Simple, okay, sorry. Um, Smart Studios is in Madison and I did end up working there eventually. But at Simple Studios, we did a lot of local bands and they didn't know what mastering was. I barely knew what mastering was. Um, booking a mastering session was just not really a reality because it meant maybe driving to Milwaukee or Chicago, or it meant sending off your um, DAT tape or CDR into the abyss. It just wasn't as easy as it is today. So it was like we ended up mastering so much of those projects because, you know, there were bands that were going to press 200 or 300 copies of their CD, and that was that. It wasn't anything extremely serious so i kind of learned the nuts and bolts of mastering um in the early 2000s just again out of necessity from these bands that would come in and they would want to finish product and they didn't really want to hear about having to send it off for mastering you know a couple a couple bands would but the majority of them just expected us to send, hand them a f finished product so i learned in a program called cd architect uh, way back in the day just the basic stuff about mastering you know sequencing the songs any crossfades, fades, just some of the detail work. And of course, making sure it sounded good. And this is right when plugins were starting to be a, a reasonable option for mastering, um, just to get things loud enough. You know, back in the 90s, you kind of had to send it out to mastering because the two processes were so separate. You know, mastering studio was only able to get your CD this loud. Um, things like that. In the early 2000s, it was became a reality for to do it, you know, outside of a mastering studio, whether it was good or not, it's a different story. But anyway, so I kind of learned early on, but then, you know, as I was getting bigger and better projects, I got, I moved down to smart studios in Madison. And then those bands were very aware of mastering and you know, sending it out to this place or that place. And I was all for it. Cause I didn't really trust myself or my ears or really know all the details. You know, I could, I could do a, a crude master, um, but that kind of informed me a little bit more about mastering was. And then, you know, but then there were still projects where I would have to master them myself and I would just learn a little bit each time and be aware of things. But, um, so was it more of a, like a self-taught process for you then? Com yeah, com completely self-taught. Um, I didn't have any mentors. Um, there was a mastering studio in Milwaukee and the guy would answer some of my questions here and there, but uh, there were basic questions like, you know, what software do you use to master? Because obviously you can't really use Pro Tools. You can you can do mastering up to a certain point in a mixing DAW, but there's eventually hit a point where, you know, you need a mastering DAW to do things like track markers, ISRC codes, uh, metadata, you know, all the, all the other stuff, The le maybe the less fun stuff to some people. But he would answer questions like that. He tipped me off to WaveLab and things like that and Sequoia, but he wasn't teaching me like, you know, the, much more of the process. So it was all self-taught, um, learning over time. And, you know, eventually my name would end up on records, like, but they were usually, you know, mixed and mastered. And I regret a number of those albums. Uh, there's some that I listen to today that I wish I wouldn't have mastered, you know, for various reasons, but it mm -hmm. was just kind of the nature of the time. Um, but eventually my name ended up being on records as only, ma you know, someone else recorded and mixed it. And then, I mastered it. So then I started to get more calls because people are thinking, oh, this person must just do mastering. And it wasn't an overnight process. It was a slow change, but I kind of slowly transitioned into just mastering as I studied even more of what the process was, you know, got, got the Bobcats book, which is kind of like the Bible. Um, it kind of, the, the cool thing about Bob's book is it, it, it teaches what it teaches you what you didn't know that you didn't know about mastering. Like, obviously, you know, there's the sonic portion of it, the stereo processing. There's a whole nother side of mastering that, again, a lot of people aren't familiar with. And it's like, maybe not the most fun part of mastering, but it's impor important details that can get easily lost if, if you're if you're not aware of them. Absolutely. And I, I totally agree with you. I think a lot of people just tend to focus on the audio portion of mastering and they think it's just putting something on a master bus. But but there really is a lot more that goes under the hood. So um to just to maybe clarify for people who are listening to this who might not be entirely certain about you know what to expect with mastering or what mastering really is, how would you describe it? 
Well, one of my favorite analogies is like the photo analogy. It's basically like, you know, framing a picture or retouching a picture. You know, you're not going to make a terrible picture amazing, but you can kind of take a picture and crop out what doesn't need to be there. You can do some retouching um, and things like that to kind of get the most out of that, that picture and enhance what's there. You know, sometimes it's more heavy handed. Sometimes it's extremely light touch if it already sounds good or looks good in the picture. There's maybe not much you need to do, but um, you know you're you're doing the work in a controlled and you know neutral environment where you can make decisions. You know your your speaker system is accurate, your monitoring is accurate. So in some cases, it's more of a quality control pass where you're just kind of doing minimal changes. You know maybe removing some clicks and pops. Of course, putting the songs in the correct order and doing any fades and li- little details like making sure the, the start of the track. And the actual downbeat of the music is a good relationship. You know, you don't want the track to start right on the downbeat. You want a little bit of a buffer so that when you skip to that track, it, but you don't want it to take an entire second or two to, for that track to start, unless the artist really wants that. So there's a lot of like sequencing details with with mastering, making sure the songs flow. Not only do the songs flow from one to the other, but then the, like I said, where the track markers are in a logical spot um, or in, and things like that. And then, Again, in the 90s, we kind of, and even in the early 2000s, there was kind of one master for everything. You know, CDs were kind of the king. Um, and then in the in the late 80s and early 90s, a CD master would typically work well on vinyl. But nowadays, you know, we're making a high-res digital master, we're making a vinyl pre-master, we're making perhaps still a CD master. For, I have a lot of clients that still make CDs, cassette master, you know, reference MP3s for their digital download cards and, you know, direct sharing with friends and family. Um, So it's not complicated. It's just detailed, you know, it's just detailed stuff. And I don't even know if I covered everything I wanted to mention, but, you know, basically it's, you know, listening to it, deciding what needs to happen. It could be a lot. It could be a little bit somewhere in between. And it's a per song basis. It's, you know, I've had people ask me, you know, do you treat each song separately? And it's like, yeah, that's the whole point of it. You know, I don't just apply the same settings to every song. I have to listen and make sure <laughs> they all make sense together as a group. You know, if, if there's an acoustic song or a, an interlude that's like with no vocals and it's just kind of a downbeat down tempo thing, you know, maybe that's not supposed to be as loud as the, the loudest song, you know? So you have to make all these decisions that, you know, computers are not really able to understand, you know, the automated mastering is not able to understand, but, as a human, I can say, yeah, this, you know, or or if you have an album with, you know, 10 rock songs and acoustic song, if you just go by the meters, that acoustic song is going to feel way too loud compared to the rock songs. You got to use your ear and kind of cue in. I usually cue into like the vocals, like, oh, do the vocals feel like they're the same level on these two songs? And that feels more natural to, to a listener and things, little things like that. So, you know, it's, that makes sense. it's a lot of. You know, it's listening from like, you know, looking at the bigger picture. You know, I'm, you know, I just had a client ask me today. The, one of the questions was, which, what compression decisions did you make regarding the keyboards? And I'm like, none. Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't control the keyboards in mastering. And I'm, I actually use very little compression in mastering. It's things are already usually so compressed. It's like. It's a lot of just more EQ and limiting and a little bit of saturation here and there, but it's not, we're not doing like six decibels of gain reduction like you would if you're recording a vocal or bass guitar. Um, you know, one or even one and a half decibels of gain reduction is a lot in mastering, and one and a half decibels of boosting of a frequency on an EQ is a lot in mastering. To be honest with you, um, especially if people are giving you tracks that are super jacked up in volume. Yeah, so it's more of a global view of the song. You know, like is how is the tone is there too much low end is there too much high end you know is there too much vocal sibilance which is a big thing that i come across um you know i'm not really i'm not really focusing on the the snare drum tone you know it's at that point it's kind of baked into the mix it's more like the the bigger picture of things absolutely it's interesting that you brought up the idea of having an album and i and i think that that is really one area that mastering 
is so important is having that unified sound across all of the songs and having things be consistent on a record. Um, and I'm curious to know, like when it comes to approaching mastering sessions when working on an album, do you tend to put all of your songs in like one session? Do you work on separate sessions? Like what does that process normally look like for you? Yeah, definitely. And I, I come from an era, like I, I just turned, well, I'm about to turn 41, but I come from an era of albums, you know, like eighties, nineties, two thousands. I know, Singles are a lot more popular now, but I still have an album mindset when I approach stuff. So yeah, I load all the songs into one session um, in the correct order, and I just kind of skip around. I tend to start with not not the first song always, but I try to pick a combination of the best sounding mix, the best overall representation of the album, so I don't start with the oddball song. Um, I just kind of... I have a way of kind of picking a good song to start with, you know, which one speaks to me the most and seems the most normal general representation. I'll start with that song and get it to where I think it's happening and sounding great. And then I'll move on to the other songs and try to get them in the same ballpark. Sometimes when I jump back to that first song, it's like, Oh, you know, the rest of the songs were a lot brighter than this song, I guess. So maybe I need, I need to decide you know, do I meet in the middle? Do I make the first, you know, so I like to have all the songs in one session so I can kind of jump around very quickly and do some comparisons before I commit to anything. So that's really where a mastering DAW comes in handy. You know, I see people trying to master in Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, and you can do the stereo processing in any program, but you reach a point where those programs are going to provide or cause limitations both in speed and your ability to, you know, do accurate work. And I don't mean sonically, I just mean as far as rendering your master files, putting in metadata, things like that. Um, but yeah, definitely do them all in one, in one big session. And another advantage to like a mastering DAW is they, they have what's called, it depends on the program, but clip effects, item effects, object effects, this means you're basically putting plugins directly on each song. You're not putting them on a track. So in a mastering program, you can get away with using a single track. Or I, I, I like to use two tracks so I can kind of... And again, that comes from learning and CD Architect. I use WaveLab now, but um, that using one or two tracks allows the waveforms to remain really large on your screen. You can see what you're doing. You're not doing the whole stair-step thing where the waveforms get super tiny. And again, you're putting the effects right on each song or clip. So, you know, if you're trying to master an album in Pro Tools, you're put, you put you got 12 tracks running a ton of plugins, it's going to bog it down very... By the time you get to the last song, you're probably really t taxing your computer. Um, but w in a mastering DAW, you're not because um, if, if, if you set it up right, the only song that's taxing your computer is the one that's being played or rendered. So... Um, there's so many advantages to using a mastering program and using the object or clip. You know, Sequoia calls it object effects. WaveLab would call it clip effects. Reaper, even though it's not a mastering program, has item effects where you can just put plugins right on an item. Pro Tools has clip effects now, as far as I know, in the in the high end version. But last I checked, it was only for their native plugins. You can't you couldn't put like Fab Filter or anything right on a clip. Maybe they've changed it. I don't really keep up with Pro Tools, but my whole point is doing it in one session like that just makes your life a whole lot easier because then you're also dialing, dialing in the spacing between songs and where the track markers are, um, the metadata. Because like when I send out a master, it's, in my opinion, done. I, I will obviously change it, but not only have I made it sound the way I think it should sound or the client asked me to make it sound, you know, the song spacing is dialed in, the track markers are dialed in, the titles are entered correctly, ISRC's codes, if if they provided them. You know, it, it, um, if they're happy with it, the, how it sounds, then it's done. There, not, no further work needs to happen. And I've seen other mastering engineers mention that, you know, maybe they send out a version to get the sounds dialed in, but then they have to go back and put the songs in the correct order. And to me, that's just too much extra work it's not extra work, but I just like to just, I want to present it as the listener is going to hear it. You know, when I send it out, it's done in my opinion. And the cool thing about that is if it is done, 
they can send that off. Then they they're ready to roll. They're not waiting on me to to uh, do any additional work. So that was a long answer to your question. But yeah, I do it all all the songs in one session, so I can really quickly hear the relationship and make changes. You know, whether it's EQ volume, I do a fair amount of automation and mastering, and not not the kind of automation people think. You know, I'm not automating EQ changes. I'm just simply automating the level. And it's the, usually the level going into the any dynamics processing and limiting, you know, because sometimes we get mixes that are too dynamic, uh, to believe believe it or not. You know, the intro is so very quiet compared to like the third chorus, and for some types of music, that's great. Um, but for the client that is loudness obsessed, sometimes when they tell you that it sounds great, but can you make it louder? A lot of times they're referring to like maybe the first verse and chorus of a song. And um, I've gotten away with um, keeping the the same loudness of like the end, but just bumping up maybe the quieter intro a little bit. Um, and then sometimes it's opposite. Sometimes a mix has no dynamics and the intro is guitar and vocals, but it's like screaming at you um, when it should be a little gentler. So I'll automate down. So I do a lot of level automation. And again, you can do that so easily in something like WaveLab, right on the the clip, um, you know, the automation. It's just, it makes my life so much easier. So um, having all the songs in one session for me is definitely key. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it any other way. Um, and I, I'm very big on getting information. Um, you know, I like to get the song order before I start and even the song titles. I've also listened to interviews where people are like, when I get a project, there's no song order, and I just can't do that because I'm like, I, there needs to be a song order at some point. So, figure, yeah, you need to know how the album grows. Yeah, or figure that. that kind of stuff, I'm, right? Basically, I'm like, you know, take take a few days. Set, it doesn't even have to be final. Give me your 80 percent track order. If we need to swap a song or two around before we finalize, that's no problem. But give me a starting point. You know, I, I can't just take a folder of files and and master them because I'm just. I'm only doing part of the job, you know, I'm, you know, you may as well send it to Lander or something at that point. Cause, um, I'm being a little bit facetious, but you know what I mean? It's like, there's still so much more to the job, you know, than just running it through something. Um, yeah. It's not just about treating the single song on its own and yeah. independent of yeah. You know, so everything I'm a, else. He, yeah. So I'm really big. My website kind of, um, encourages this when they submit a project, but you know, what is the track order? What are the songs called? You know, things like that. It just helps me get, it helps me get the job done faster and better. And honestly, spend more time on the music and less time on some of the administrative work that is important, but, you know, doesn't need to be such a struggle because you just, um, you know, I'm, I'm asking the same questions for every project. You know, what's the artist name? What's the album title? What are the song titles? What are the song order? What formats are you releasing? It's all on my website too. People can fill this out without even having to contact me. It's great. And then then I have all their details and I'm ready to roll. I don't have to ask them 10 questions that are spread out over 10 emails. And then you might miss a de- might miss a detail. So um yeah, that's a bit that's really important to me to have the song. At least obviously if someone decides they want to switch a song or two around, it's not a big deal. Obviously I need to know that before we finalize. But because even if you switch a song around that does and can affect the spacing, the flow of songs, because sometimes people tell me, like, just put put two seconds between each song. But the question is, when do you perceive the song as being done? If it has a really slow sustain at the end, like a, a long keyboard fade out, if you're listening in your car, that song is going to end sooner than listening in a quiet room on headphones or nice speakers. Because in that quiet environment, you're going to hear every last um, ounce of that sustain. Um, in a noisier environment like a car, it's going to the road noise and the car noise is going to make it feel like it ended maybe a second sooner. So you can't just say put two seconds between each song because that's going to be a different perception depending on how it's being listened to. So I do all the song spacing by ear and feel. And it's uh, it's uh, <coughs> excuse me it's obviously very easy to change once the client hears it. But my point was even if if you just decide to flip a couple songs around in order, I st- I need to revisit the spacing again because there's no guarantee that it's gonna the flow is gonna be good uh, if, if I just 
drag the songs around without listening to it. So it's not hard, but it is something that you have to pay attention to as the mastering engineer. And I think that that's one of the like artistic sides of mastering in a way too, right? Where you are kind of shaping that flow, the full experience of listening to the album. Yeah, um, on my website again, I have a a short. It's not that short. It, it's, I guess, some people will call it a high friction form, but for me, it works because it kind of weeds out people that aren't serious. But one of the questions is about the song spacing. It says, you know, do you want tight transitions? This is a punk album where it's like no breaths. Do you want normal transitions where I'd kind of use my judgment or do you want extended, you know, if it's a classical record, they might want four seconds between the songs. But again, if the la- if, if, if it's a song with a, like a, a long reverb tail, where it technically ends is subjective because it depends how closely you're listening to it. But I have a little, I have them give me a rough idea of what they want. I also say that if you have really specific ideas, um, just send me an MP3 of the whole album as one long file. I don't use the MP3 to master from, of course, but what I do is I load that MP3 into WaveLab, and WaveLab has a great thing called reference tracks where they're in your session, but um, they're not part of the main signal path. Um, So what I can do is just kind of visually line up what I've done to their MP3 for as far as any song crossfades or specific transitions. So I would say 10 to 20% of clients will send me a mock-up of how they want it spaced out. Um, it just as it can be an MP3. You can do it in GarageBand if you want to. It doesn't have to sound great. It just has to get the point across. And then that, that usually gets us 99% there. But honestly, a lot of times people are happy with what I do. And thankfully I'm at a point where, you know, I'm kind of in a groove here and a lot of times I get a lot of version one mastering approvals now just because I've got such a streamlined system. And if there are any changes, a lot of times it's just songs, you know, can we add add another second between these songs and, you know, little things like that. And it's, it's weird because I've had people ask me if the distributor is going to do that or the CD manufacturer. And it's like, no, we, we have to do this. This is part of our job right now. Like your digital distributor is not going to add or subtract, you know, this is mastering, you know, <laughs> this and, is it. Yeah. And um, <laughs> unfortunately I think some of the software companies have sort of bastardized the term mastering. And that's why people are confused about this. They've kind of stolen mastering as the stereo processing. Um, I don't want, well, maybe I do want to name names. Maybe I don't, but um, people now think of mastering as just the stereo processing, but there's so much else that happens. And I know I said it before, it's not the most exciting parts of the process. And I used to teach a mastering class to younger, you know, as a technical college, tech school. And a lot of the students, they just wanted to, you know, make beats and mastering was probably kind of boring to most of them. But I'm like, you know, I know this isn't the most exciting part, but it's a detail that, you know, someone's got to pay attention to. Um, You know, I, I remastered an old Dirty Bastard album and the song sequencing is insanely critical there because all the songs flow into each other. There's barely a, a moment of silence on that record. And, you know, making the beats was probably fun. Obviously, the doing the vocals was fun. But then there came a time when someone had to master that the original version and tie all the songs together. And the sound, aside from making them sound good, you know, you got to make sure that it flows, but then also that it's going to be correct on a CD. You know, that record was made before streaming services, but they had to make sure that on the CD, you know, there was no glitches. And then Mm -hmm. when I I remastered it, I had to recreate that, but then also make sure it was still streaming friendly as far as the song transitions and stuff like that. So there are, there's just a lot of details that go into it, but it's kind of unfortunate how some plugin companies and some of the automated mastering services have kind of dumbed down or stolen the, stolen the term mastering and I've actually written an article and I said, you know, if these companies would just call it automated stereo bus processing, I would have no problem with that because that's really what it's doing. But it's it's not mastering as far as I'm concerned because it, 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 it just factually doesn't do certain things. And again, they may be simple, they may be boring, but there are things they don't do. In fact, I had a somebody reach out to me that used Lander to master their project and... 
I know there are certain people that think CDs are dead, but CDs are really alive. You know, maybe not even through COVID um, when no shows were happening, I still made a lot of CD masters and sent it out to CD companies. But especially when live shows are happening, that's what that's the way bands make a few dollars these days is selling CDs. Uh, maybe not younger people, but I would say if your demographic is people like 30 and older, you're still selling CDs at shows. You know, people like to get drunk and buy CDs and have the band sign them and probably never listen to them, but they're a thing that people make. And um, what was my point? Oh, and this was actually a younger, I would say this, this artist was younger than 25, probably closer to 20. Anyways, he used Lander and then he found out that you can't send your files from Lander to a CD company. It's not a CD master, right? Yeah, you don't so have he, the PDP out of it. Yeah, his 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 CD company, who I happen to know, they're actually in the same city as me. You know, they said, "No, we need a DDP file. It's it's really boring." But um, so he reached out to me to to make that. And again, it's not. I'm not saying it's hard or I'm a genius because I can do it. But somebody has to do it. And then that opens up all these other cans of worms. Like, is the song spacing correct? Yeah, um, and you have the, the right CD- tools for it. Yeah, is the CD text correct? You know, like how do you, um, when someone puts that CD in their car, you know, cars are probably the best place to actually view CD text, which is information that's embedded on the CD. It's different than what pops up when you stick a CD in your computer. That, that That's um, usually Grace Note database. It's an online database. It's really confusing because iTunes does not, and Windows Media Player, they don't read CD text. You think they would. But what they do is they look at the number of tracks and how long they are. Then they reference an online database and say, we think this is, the- have you ever put in a CD and it's like totally the wrong or it gives yeah, you choices? Wrong that, that's track names and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's just because there happens to be another CD with the same amount of songs with the exact same track times. Like it's just a fingerprint. Anyway, so then it's like, you know, what are the songs called? How do you want to capitalize? You know, just little stuff. All the stuff that Lander's not doing, any automated mastering service is not doing. So my whole point was, if they would just call it automated stereo processing, I would have no problem with it. But um, they've kind of successfully changed the term. So we almost need to come up with a new term like human mastering or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, we need a new word for the people who are actually doing it Yeah, properly. or detail, you know, something, you know, where some professional uh, mastering like, yeah. yeah and there is a place i'm not knocking you know if you do library production music and you just want um your songs to be processed and make get a double check you know yeah. i'm not I, in that article i wrote i purposely don't even comment on the sound because there's no point it's subjective it depends what you put into it what you want to get out of it how good you know how good your ears are and can tell if it's destroying it or making it better you know i know of a good mix engineer that has learned how to mix into lander pretty well and he's happy with the results but also when he when it came time to do his solo album he had me master his solo album but for some of the other clients that maybe don't have the budget for mastering he's kind of learned how to mix into lander and you can get a streaming master maybe out of lander but once you talk about vinyl master or cd production um, or even start to care about detail. You know, I'm I'm such an R, you know, Isotope RX. I'm I'm kind of OCD about that as far as removing clicks and pops and um, you know mouth clicks, clicks from keyboard, weird keyboard things or bad edits or plosives, um, even sibilance. You know, I've given up kind of on stereo DSing. I mean, I do a little bit of it, but the best method is just going s by s with rx and addressing it because then it's to me it's more transparent but anyways there's a place for these automated services but um but they're not doing the same same detail that you're you're putting into it there's almost no detail compared to what a human is going to to do and again it's not about how it sounds it's more about you know details and facts that they're just actually not doing and if you don't care about those details then maybe lander's for you but um, you know, if you're going to release this into the world forever, you probably want a human to have gone through it with, you know, some intelligence, some real <laughs> intelligence, not artificial intelligence, real intelligence, emotion, you know, I, know. I, I always think about that too. I, anytime a band's asked me about things like Lander, I'm always like, 
how much time have you spent like writing these songs, recording these songs, like agonizing over different takes and performances and editing and mixing? Like you spent so much time on that. And why would you then pass it off to a computer algorithm that isn't listening to your music? And in a fraction of a second, it's going to create the final version of your song. Like, don't you want any control of that? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's crazy. So I, you know, I'm just, and I, tr- you know, I grew up playing in bands that made very little money. So I try to make my rates, you know, mastering doesn't have to be insanely expensive. Um, if you want to spend a lot of money on mastering, you certainly can, but there's so many people that do really great work for an extremely reasonable price. And I did a little bit of Lander research when I wrote the article. I mean, I feel like by the time you actually pay for getting, you know, the high resolution files and whatnot, you're not hiring a, a quality human mastering engineer. Isn't a, a, a huge um, step up not, in price. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, I mean, it's more, but it's not like, you know, if you find the right person, and I also hear these stories on forums. It's like, oh, I hired this person a master and they ruined it and they took my money. And I just think that's that's a person that's a bad personal choice. Like it doesn't not all mastering engineers are like that. You know, the way that I work is for EPs and albums, I don't even send an invoice until it's approved. So if for some reason you're not happy with it, um, you've lost a little bit of time, but you know, I'm not gonna like send you the first version, have you hate it, take your money and not answer your emails. Cause that's, that's terrible. Um, I mean, it's one thing to be known as doing a bad master, but to be known for doing a bad master and taking someone's money, that's just, um, that's even worse. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's stories online about mastering engineers, you know, like I said, totally ruining it and you can't get a hold of them anymore and they're taking your money. But I, I don't see that happening. You know, I'm, I chat with a handful of mastering engineers on various forums and platforms. And I, I don't think any of them would do that. You know, there are, I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure it's happened, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's so common or it shouldn't be presented as the norm. I mean, it's all about communication really. I mean, you need to explain what, what it is, what, what your visions are. Um, then yep. listen to what's done you know, ask for feed, you know, ask for changes. You know, I love getting feedback. Thank, like I said, thankfully I get a lot of version one approvals these days, but I also get revision notes too sometimes, and I'm happy to make those changes. So it's not, you just have to communicate what it is that you want and, and you'll be there. So anyways, mm-hmm. I don't, I think there's so many people that do great work for a reasonable price that I think landers should just really be reserved for like, you know, seeing what happens to your mix when it gets smashed by a limiter or again if you're doing a high volume of like library tracks and you just don't have the time maybe run it through lander and they'll be at a certain level and consistency that works for that um type of music but as far as releasing eps and albums and even singles you know i I think a human is the way to go and i I know i'm biased because i do it for a living but you know once i started doing mastering full-time it's like all these things I didn't know that I didn't know. And it's not like secretive stuff. It's actually kind of boring, detailed stuff, but it's stuff that matters. And there's a reason why there's a reason why these mastering programs exist. Um, of you course. Know. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you did a great job there of just explaining a lot of the differences between these mastering programs versus what you would normally have in pro tools or logic or whatever programs. So, you know, I think, that that part of the, your answer there in itself, I think people will start to realize like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, my software doesn't do this stuff. And like, oh, yeah, I've never thought about sequencing an album, that kind of stuff. And, and, and on the topic of automated mastering services, I feel like a lot of people tend to use them because they are either newer and they've never used mastering before. And so they're like, do I really need to pay for this? Like, they don't understand what, what it's going to do. So, you know, people are taking a chance on this, like, you know, usually it's pretty affordable to get into these automated services. So they're trying it out. Um, and then I feel like it seems like people tend to go from like, they try something like Lander and they either like it or they don't. Then if they don't like it, they might try to master it themselves and like, you know, just work on the stereo bus processing side of it. And then if they don't, if they're not any good at it, then maybe they'll understand like, okay, I need to hire a mastering engineer. Um, for people who who are kind of in that middle stage of thinking like, well, maybe I do want to just take it on myself and then I have that human touch. Like, do you feel like you need to be able to mix records in order to be able to master records? Like, do you, do you feel like that's kind of a prerequisite? 
I don't think it's essential. I, I think it certainly helped me train my ears. Um, and I always hear stories of back in the day, like, you know, people starting at Abbey Road and some of these famous studios that a lot of times they would start in the mastering room first because that taught them what worked and, you know, that taught them how, what they can get away with mixing wise. If you're seeing the end product, learning what sounds good, what doesn't sound good. And again, this is in the vinyl days, but what works on vinyl, what doesn't. Once you understand that, then you can become a better mix engineer. So in some cases, it was backwards back in those days. Mm -hmm. For me, it was the other direction, just again, out of necessity and, and the way that my, the tra trajectory of my career. But um, I don't think, you know, I, I know of some people that skip straight to mastering. You know, I did a lot of mixing first, but I kind of burned out on mixing and sort of priced myself out of mixing because I was so... I wanted to spend so much more time on the mix than the budget was allowing. And I would, but then th that meant I'm working nonstop with, you know, and maybe not getting compensated as fairly. Um, so that was part of my decision to move into mastering because it's a more fast paced process. I really enjoyed the process. All the, you know, when I got it, started researching it more, I'm like, wow, I actually really love this. Um, so I don't know if that answers your, your question well, but I think, you know, Mixing can certainly help just, again, train your ears as to what sounds good and things like that and, and know what's even possible, but I don't think it's essential. You know, I think, I think what's essential is just, you know, the 10,000 hour rule of no matter what you're doing, uh, it just takes time. There's no overnight shortcut path to it really. Yeah. Um, I see how it could be kind of how it can work both ways, right? Because like you, at the end of the day, whether you're learning how to mix first or you're learning how to master first at the end of the day, you're trying to always create the greatest quality you can. And that involves knowing the tools. And so you have to learn the tools one way or another. And so, you know, if you, whether you just jump all into mastering and you learn how to use EQ and compression and all that stuff, or you do it all in mixing, you're still kind of starting from the same point, same starting point. But I guess from the mastering side, if, if you're learning mastering first, then you're getting your ears kind of tuned to what a final master should sound like and ultimately what your mixes should sound like too, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I love the saying like, you know, record like there's no mixing, mix like there's no mastering um, and things like that because the happier you are with it earlier on, it's just going to be that much better. You know, I love doing lighter touch mastering projects, not because they're easier, just because then I can focus on things, you know, I'm not putting out, big fires now i'm just focusing more on little details and stuff like that um but you know there are projects that need a lot more work than others um but i just think you know whatever works for you it just it's all to me and i i think i'm of the opinion that you're never done learning you know i i, I still learn new stuff every week every day sometimes um and i've been doing this for a little while so i just think it's always about keeping your ears open and keeping up with technology um, and things like that is, is the main thing. And then from a mastering context, you know, when I was younger, you know, I, I regret not making sure my monitors and room treatments were as good as they could be. Cause that would have saved me so much time. I, I looking back, you know, I was just fighting, you know, mixing and, and terrible sounding rooms, you know, and once I got my mastering room dialed in, um, it's like, wow, it's, it's, it's so much easier to make decisions and hear and understand what needs to happen when you when you can when you have a great sounding room or even now i had you know some of the odyssey headphones are pretty amazing um sounding and you can make decisions on those so i mean i think i underestimated monitoring the monitoring path in the room when i was younger and you know had i taken that a little more seriously it might have helped speed things along and maybe not only make mixes turn out better, but get, get to the end result faster and with less back and forth with the client. Of course. Yeah. One thing you had talked about earlier that I thought was interesting to, to maybe go into a little bit more detail with is you were talking about your website and how you've kind of created a system for yourself on your website that allows you to not have to have as much back and forth with the artists. And, and, um, ultimately that probably allows you to work much faster and smarter and, and, you know, just probably take on more projects at the same time. Um, so I love I love that idea of creating systems to, to work more efficiently. And I've heard you talk in other podcasts about the importance of using macros in your process. 
And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about macros and maybe maybe some of the uh, macros or scripts that you've created to help streamline your process even further. Yeah, I mean, I honestly think I could do a whole lot better. But as far as the website goes, you know, as I got into mastering, I'm like, I started to realize it was a slow transition. You know, I was still mixing records, um, but I want to get into mastering. And I'm realizing, you know, I'm asking everybody the same questions about their project uh, as far as the details, the administrative side of things. So I asked my website guy, I'm like, can we just make a form where people can just, because, you know, p- people would send me a PDF or something or a Word document and they would always forget something. It would be, whether it was the band name or the album title, I have to say, okay, um, you know, can you tell me the album title? It's not on the sheet. Oh yeah, we forgot about it. So I made this form and just, um, that, that cuts down on so much back and forth emails. It's kind of like my secretary or, you know, and I, it's funny, I, I don't want to name the name, but there's an older mastering studio that posted a picture of their office person, you know, that takes the phone calls and stuff. And there was a time when we had to do that, right? Um, and their rates are probably higher than mine, but I feel like I can offer a more affordable rate because I am just a one-person operation here because I have systems in place to handle incoming projects. You know, I don't have to have someone answering the phone to say, oh, one song costs this much. Three songs is this much. Do you have instrumental versions? That's this much. You know, everything is instantly available on the website to see the price and submit the project. So literally, you know, when we get done with this podcast, I can guarantee you there's going to be one or two projects that came in through my website. I have all the details. I have the files. I can start mastering it the moment we hang up this um, Zoom call. And that's amazing to me. That saves me so much time. Um, it's it's ridiculous how much time it saves. So I'm a big fan of that. You know, I see so many mastering websites that say, give us a call to discuss your project. And it's not that I won't discuss projects on phone calls with people, but not everybody wants or needs that really. Sometimes they just want to get to work. Um, I know it's different with production and mixing because there's so many details. That, um, it's hard to predict the price of mixing a song or producing a song or album for somebody, but mastering is very fairly predictable. And sorry, if this goes long, you can even edit it out if you want, but no, it's great. The story always sticks in my mind. I already had the form in place, but probably five years ago, we decided to get a new, this is a dumb story. We got a new furnace and air conditioner at our house. And I had to be home that day because to be around the house. So I couldn't be at my studio and I couldn't even get any work done in my home studio because they're just making so much noise, putting in this furnace and all this stuff. So I'm just doing stuff on my laptop and I'm like, man, that's a really nice looking new air conditioner. Uh, um, I should probably get a cover for it, you know, to protect it. And because it was, it was like November, it's about to start snowing. So I'm looking around online and I find a, a bunch of places that say, yeah, we sell air conditioner covers. Give us or email us and we'll get back to you in, you know, 48 hours, whatever, or, or try to call us or there's, you know, you click the contact button and the, the link doesn't work. I finally found this place in Canada. Um, it was a website that sold air conditioner covers among other things. And it's like, put in the model number of your air conditioner. Yes, we have this, you know, do you want gray? Do you want, what color do you want? I didn't have to talk to a person. I didn't have to do I just had, it was so easy. That's who won my business. It wasn't, it might not have been the cheapest option, but I went to this website and I was able to put in what I needed. They told me they had it. I paid for it. It was the simplest thing. It took all of 10 minutes or less. And a few days later, I had an air conditioner cover. You know, I don't want to talk on the phone about an air conditioner cover to somebody. I just want to tell them what I need tell them what they need to know, boom, it's done. So that's kind of how my website is set up for those that want it. I get so many projects from people that have never contacted me before. And the first time I hear of the project is the form was submitted on my website with all the song titles, song order, formats they need, band name, album title. Who else to email the master to when it's ready? You know, because with the band, you know, you want to send it to the whole band or if there's management, um, when they need it done by that was the best thing I did. I used to assume every project was an emergency. So I'd like kind of, I'd like panic. Like, oh, they need this done like tomorrow. But I put a little like calendar, like when do you need this done by? And some people do need it done right away, but some people are like, we can wait a month. That's cool. 
and that just takes the pressure off. You're like, oh, okay, I don't have to do this like right away. But anyways, um, so that's one, the biggest way of automating things for me is just automating the administrative side of things. So I don't have to hire someone to do it. Um, at this time, I probably could hire somebody to do it, but when I made it, it was out of necessity because I couldn't afford to hire somebody. And I was personally wasting so much time on that stuff. So I just set up the website and then, you know, that goes to my email, that goes to my project management software. Um, so I can keep kind of prioritize projects of like this, one, this one's been sitting for a while. This one can sit for a while. This one's been sent out I'm waiting for feedback on it. You know, this one's done those kind of things. But as far as other macros, I mean, I don't, my my actual mastering process is kind of strange because if I'm going to use analog gear, which I use on maybe a little more than half the projects still, I do that in a program called Reaper because of all the scripts that can be made. It's just a really efficient program. And I don't know how to do the scripting myself, but I've, I've hired somebody. Um, if I get stuck on something, he makes a crazy script for me. And it's just all this time-saving stuff. Um, and... I still finish projects in WaveLab, as I mentioned. If I'm going to do everything in the box in WaveLab, oh, sorry, if I'm going to do everything in the box, I use WaveLab, you know, for the entire process. So it's just about creating shortcuts. If you're doing repetitive tasks, you know, I have a Stream Deck. I don't know if you're familiar with the Stream Deck. Oh yeah, I, I got one of those. Um, They're great. Yeah. So if, if you if it's like I always do this and then I do that and then I do this, you can just program that as one button. You just press one button on the thing. Um, you know, and I have one task. It's it's a boring story, but I have one task that takes about thirty seconds, and I press it, and then I check my email or go to the bathroom quick. And when I come back, it's done. Um, but I'm all about with mastering. It's like such a re- repetitive process. Again, not with not as far as plug in chains or anything like that. Just as far as like the um, logistics of it, like getting the files, uh, having a folder structure that makes sense. Um, naming files you know so i know that like if a folder says 2496 wave that's 24 bit 96k masters of their project if it says 1644 that's the 16 bit you know all this stuff if you would look into my archives everything is named the same way you know it's artist like i, I can identify it by the artist name and uh, release title but then all the formats, everything's named the same way. So that if I look at it in three years or seven years, I know exactly what I'm looking at. Everything's structured the same way. So you kind of just got to get in these patterns. And I know I've, you had Chris Graham on your show, right? Yeah. Um, at one point, he, he, I, I never thought about this term, but he talks about flow state a lot. And I get in a flow state quite often. I realized um, when I'm just, you know, today I'm not in a flow state because I'm doing a podcast, but if I'm working on masters, I just get in. It's almost like I'm playing the piano. I'm just like doing this, listening, pressing this. It's just such a, it literally is a flow state where it's like, I don't have to think about what I'm going to call my session file because I call them the same. And I have a stream deck that, you know, I have to copy and paste the artist name, of course. But when it comes to the other stuff, I press a button or I have a program called the, copy and paste copy em paste you can save um you know how many times do you type your email address a day i have a shortcut that puts my you know some some forms have autofill but if someone says hey what's your email address i have a key command i can press and it spits out my email address um and i have all these other like strings of text that i use in my workflow when i'm naming mastering sessions or naming folder names or you know when i do save as and make the vinyl master i have a shortcut that says you know 24 bit 96 well it says 24 96 vinyl master version one um so i don't have to type that out it's just so i guess copy and paste is a big one for me too i just like i realized i'm like i'm always typing the same thing let me you can save a list and assign key commands for these strings of text that you're always doing and it may not be as useful in production but for mastering, when you're, uh, it's it's a huge time saver. Like if I didn't have that program, I'd I'd probably retire. <laughs> no, I wouldn't retire. <laughs> but you know what I mean. It'd be such a slowdown. I'd be like, yeah. So I really get in like a flow state with copy and paste and stream deck and 
that's great. Some yeah, of the, it, some of those other tools things are so that, important. Like you don't realize how much time you spend doing non-audio related things. That and, and yeah, that's and a great email templates. Of, when I sent, when I get a master done, whether it's a single or an album, I have a program called Mail Butler. That it's kind of an add-on to. I, I I like to use Apple Mail. I have a Gmail address, but I like the Apple Mail program. Some people hate it. I hate going on the web for mail because it's just slow and ugly, in my opinion. I like the Apple Mail program. And there's a little add-on called Mail Butler, and it does a number of things. I originally got it because you could schedule emails, which I know you can do on the Gmail website. But in Apple Mail, it lets you schedule emails. And I used to do that because back when I had slower upload speeds, um, sometimes I'd have these large files, and I would want to delay the email to go out until after the file was uploaded because I didn't want the client to say, the link doesn't work you know, because mm-hmm. they got it too fast. Now I have blazing fast upload speed, so it's not a problem. But the other cool thing with Mail Butler is all these email templates that you can save. And I know there's a number of ways to save email templates, whether it's a Word document or notes or whatever. But Mail Butler embeds right in your Apple Mail, right on your new email window. So when I'm do- when I'm uh, done with a single or an album, it it puts all this text in the email and then all I have to do is drop in the, the, the link to, for them to listen to it or download it. But it tells them everything about how to listen to the master, what to listen for, what to do if they're happy with it, what to do if they have changes. And then I even have like an email template for when I did make a change. I say, I made some adjustments. Here's the new link. And I can always um, add in some personal, you know, like I've made some adjustments this version is a little louder. I've made some adjustments. I can add that this version is brighter, less bright. You know, I can I can expand on it, but having an email template for initial masters, revisions, after the mastering is done, I have a little email that goes out um, just to say thank you and where to find me on social media and all, all that good stuff. So email templates are another thing that in the mastering world saves so much time. That's great. Um, yeah, I use something very similar. Uh, I use Text Expander, which is same idea where you can create a, a, some shortcuts, or like, um, or you can just type like, you know, if I do like comma e, it like will type out a giant email or whatever. You know, like I can I can program it to be whatever I want, and you can have like fillable fields as well, where you can say like name, and anytime you use that name, it repeats it automatically for you in the email and stuff stuff like that. Like it really does save a lot of time, and especially for you know, I love that example that you gave of how to listen to your master. That's definitely an email that I've sent many times. That is a pretty lengthy email, and yeah. to just press one button, have it done in five seconds, rather than spend like ten minutes writing an email, it that that adds up over time. Yeah, there's two. I have another program that was really overlooked. It's called Alfred. It's it's for Mac oh, yeah, users. That's a great one too. Yeah, Alfred's great. I mean, it's, it it can also kind of save text snippets and create shortcuts for commonly used things. But what I also like it for is it has a clipboard history. So I mean, if you mm-hmm. copied a a song title five minutes ago, you can just press a shortcut and everything and any text that you've copied and pasted recently is available to paste again you know it's like a clipboard history thing it's just all these little tools that to some people might sound dumb but for me it just helps me get through my day faster more accurately and then even you know we talked about cds a lot but there's a cd company that a lot of my local clients use and i have that on a template too it just says hey so and so here's the approved master for then it's empty, and I just paste in the band name and album title. And I say the client is CC'd. If you have any questions, thank you, blah, blah, blah. And that saves me so much time in the course of a month or a year just having it all. And it's accurate. There's no spelling mistakes that look kind of unprofessional. So to me, so I'm not using like macro, like I don't know how to use the Apple Automator program or anything like that. I'd, I'd love to take some downtime and learn that. But for me, it's all about, you know, streamlining repetitive tasks that do all the time and getting in a flow state where like, like I said, on really busy days, I feel like I'm playing my studio like an instrument. I'm just like making it sound how it should sound, rendering it, getting it into wave lab, sequencing, CD text, metadata, you know, all the stuff. It's just like, I'm not even thinking about it. It's just, it's just flowing through me because I have created so many 
you know, I can really fly through, um, and I, I and I don't mean fly through like I'm not listening to it. The, it actually allows me to listen to it more because I'm flying through the the tedious stuff more quickly. Um, Absolutely. By, ha- by having all these systems in place, I mean that's one thing that that's just gradually ramped up over the last ten years. I mean, if I would, if I were to, if I could time travel and sit on a day of work 10 years ago, I'd probably just be like cringing at how <laughs> slow and sloppy I was working back then compared to now. Cause and, you know, the other, you know, just little things like, yeah, rendering the file, you know, making sure the, uh, I could go on and on, but it's yeah. just, <laughs> there's so many details with mastering that I think just get overlooked and for, you know, for good reason. I mean, it's more fun to mix a song probably. And, and all that stuff you're not you're not worrying about is there too much dead space before or after the song yeah. you know is is there hissing are there clicks and you know and a lot of times clicks and pops fly under the radar in an unmastered mix but once once it gets kind of made louder and mastering and more clear you know those things that were under the radar in my, to my ears they jump out like like crazy and then that's that's the time to address them is in mastering so for sure Well, we definitely talked a lot about a lot of the details that go into mastering. And one area that I'd love to talk a little bit about is that I feel like whenever you're talking about mastering, it mastering is usually connected to a conversation of levels and like monitoring and metering and that kind of stuff. Um, What levels do you typically aim for when mastering a track? And are you paying attention to things like peak RMS, LUFS? Like what what should be what should people be concerned with? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's so many myths on the internet. Like, you have to master to minus 14 LUFS now, which I think is an unfortunate myth. Um, you know, I'm just listening. I have such a, again, not to keep repeating, but I have such a flow state where when I set up a mastering project, one of the things that it does is it it normalizes all the songs to a certain level. And when people think of normalizing, they think of streaming services and peak levels. Um what my process does is it, it normalizes each song to the same short-term maximum LUFS. So basically, the loudest part of each song is now the same level for the most part. I still listen. I still fine-tune it by ear. And again, this is before I even start. This gets all the songs on the same page so that um, everything is kind of feeding in, whether it's my analog chain or just in my in-the-box chain. And this is something that you've automated? Um, sort of, um, I mean, wave lab does it. Wave lab has a meta normalizer inside of it. Reaper does it too. Um, Reaper was a little more of a custom job to do that, but you know, one thing that I'll never not do anymore is, you know, once I load in a song, a bunch of songs or even one song is just, I, I normalize it to a certain maximum short-term LUFS. I don't use integrated cause that could be weird if the song builds up from quiet to loud, Basically, what I want is the loudest part of each song to be hitting the same level. I don't, and that level it doesn't even matter because it depends what you do with that. You know, I have some, <laughs> I have some plug and chains settings that get me really close, and then I fine tune by ear and 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 do what needs to happen. But as far as the end result, that is really a project by project case. You know, I get part of my intake form is how do you feel about loudness? You know, do you want it to be super loud? Do you want me to really preserve the dynamics or do you want me to kind of find the sweet, what I think is the sweet spot where it's not going to be the loudest album of all time. It's going to be a healthy level and we're going to kind of maintain clarity, maintain some transient peaks. You know, the funny thing is like loud and punchy is sort of an oxymoron because as you make things really loud with a digital limiter, you're actually shaving off any drum peaks and transients. So what was punchy is now not punchy in my opinion. Um, So I like to get a feel for what the client wants. And also the music honestly informs me as well. If I'm working on a traditional jazz album, um, I know what is considered, you know, normal and acceptable versus a metal album or a punk album. So I can usually kind of, um, you know, the thing with mastering engineers is it's not uncommon to work on a jazz album and a punk album on the same day or the same back to back days. You know, you gotta be, you gotta be very genre, uh, multi genre, um, proficient, I guess you could say. So usually the style of music informs me where I'm going to take it. 
um, you know, if it's an if it's an acoustic project or full band arrangements. Um, but you know, I do have a lot of metering here. I have some Doro meters that do RMS. WaveLab has great built-in metering for LUFS, and I have the Clarity M. Um, you know, I don't think you want to just look at the meters specifically, or um, only look at the meters. But meters can meters can sort of confirm what you're hearing and just be a double check, if you will. Um, and I really don't believe in, you know, I have some frequency analyzers, but I never use them to make decisions. They're sort of just there again to confirm what I'm hearing. Or sometimes it's like, did I just hear a plosive? Especially if it's like an acoustic song, you can really hear those plosives on the microphone. And if I can hear it, and if I see a huge low frequency bump on the meter, then it's like, yeah, there's definitely a plosive there I need to address. So again, I never like try to make the frequency analyzer look a certain way. It's just kind of there as a, you know, in a way it's a little bit like your speedometer. Like if you're on the highway, you know, like if there's a lot of other traffic, you know about how fast you should be going, but your speedometer is like confirms that you're going the right speed um, or the speed that you want to go. But I don't know if that answers your question about metering or levels, but um, I have heard people say that they do two masters, you know, one for streaming and one for CD. And I, I don't believe in that. And the reason being is let's say you did a master at minus 14 LUFS and then you did a louder CD master that was maybe minus nine, you know, integrated LUFS. Those aren't just going to be different loudnesses. Those are going to be two different characters. Um, as you push louder, as I mentioned, like the first thing to suffer is usually the the transients, you know, the, any percussion or drums, those are going to get diminished. And then what's going to be appear louder is anything that's lower level, like the melodic stuff, guitars, keyboards, um, anything that's kind of sitting below the transient levels is sort of going to appear a little bit louder. And, um, and that all depends how loud you go. So not only do you have two different levels, at that point you have two different sounding masters and that's just way too confusing for unless someone is like 1000% sure that's what they want. I'll do it. I think I've done it maybe once, but usually people think it's a good idea on paper. And then I explain why it's not a great idea. And the other reason why it's not a great idea is not all streaming services normalize by default. Um, they all have slightly different levels. I just think it's a, not a great idea to do two different loudnesses. I think it's, pick one that works and go with it. Um, and those streaming, cha- uh, streaming services can always change their levels as well. So yeah, you know. they can, and they have, and they will again. And hopefully, you know, there was an AES paper, audio engineering society paper, trying to get all the streaming services to get on the same page so that at least they're all using the same means of measuring and target level. But that could be a few years if it even ever happens at all. You know, you can overthink it, but my opinion is, you know, make it sound as good as you can at digital full scale, which means it's a pretty, you know, as, without any level changes. If it sounds great, it's going to sound good everywhere. Um, y- yes, it might get turned down in some cases, but if it sounds good at full scale, it's going to sound good at any level. Um, where I like to use those tools is some clients are really obsessed with how it's going to sound on Spotify specifically. And then we can say, yeah, you know, if we're going to get that granular, the song would get turned down five or six decibels on Spotify. So if you're concerned with being really loud on Spotify, going even louder with the masters, actually now you're fighting yourself because it's just going to, the louder you go, the more it's going to come down and you're squashing all the transients, the detail and clarity out of it. So you're kind of, you're just fighting yourself. So if, if that's your only goal, then maybe you want to figure out more of a, a sweet spot. But then there's the case of, you know, the Spotify web player on the website does not normalize, but the desktop and mobile apps do. So if you go on the Spotify website and you do like a more reasonable, less squashed master, and then you compare it to something that is squashed, it's going to sound quieter. And then you might mm. be upset about that. So it's, it's just, this kind of this huge mess. So I don't believe in mastering to any certain number really just, I have the lu- one thing that I forget about is I have the luxury here of going as loud as I think it's going to go. And I can hear right when it starts to go downhill and I can stop there. 
but sometimes client, you know, I don't really do attended sessions. So sometimes clients hear the master and they say, it's great, but can we make it a little louder? And then I do. And then sometimes they love that. And then sometimes they're like, yeah, you're right. It's, it's too, uh, you know, it's too squash sounding now. It just sounds too, too, too overcooked. You know, can we, can we dial back or maybe split the difference? Um, so basically I take it as loud as I think it can and needs to go before it falls apart because honestly, the, the loudness potential is really in the mix. Not, not, not so much the mastering, you know, like mm-hmm. if you recorded a, a band with like three SM 57s and a carpeted basement and made it minus 10 LUFS. And then you took a different mix that was like world-class, one of the best mixes of all time and made that minus 10 LUFS. That mix is probably going to sound louder than maybe the lesser mix. So there's, you can't just go by numbers really. You have to, every mix has kind of a loudness potential of how loud you can go with it before it either starts to get, you know, diminishing returns or start to get worse. Um, and people think of loudness as a mass loudness is, you know, a mastering thing too, but it's not the be all end all. It's not like I can just make something that doesn't want to go super loud, super loud. I mean, it depends on bass content too, you know, um, there's a ton of low end that's going to steal up headroom faster than something that's really bright and harsh with not a lot of low end. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Another area that I wanted to ask you about too, is that I know when it comes to mastering the topic of bit depth and sample rates, that can be really important. Um, can you talk about what sort of settings people should be recording at and how they should be preparing their files for mastering? Yeah. Cause people do overthink this a little bit. Um, the best sample rate to record at, is whatever is best for your computer. Um, you know, if you have an older computer and you try to record at 96K, the recording session might go fine, but once you start mixing and putting plugins on, it might get bogged down very quickly at 96K. Um, and I've had people, or I've known of people that had to like downsample all their stuff to 44.1 so they can mix it, you know, the way they wanted to mix it. So there's no best sample rate. It's just whatever your computer can handle. If your com- if your computer can handle 96k, that's great. You know, I, I think um, I think 96k is sort of the point of diminishing returns. If when you go higher than that, I mean, then you're getting kind of into like um, audio file world. You know, it's hard to it's hard to you might um, the amount of hard drive space and computer power you're using might not be worth the, uh, the troubles you're going to encounter. But I do have one guy that I work with. He records at 192 K cause he's only mix. He's mixing on an analog board. He only uses the computer to record and play mm. the files. He's not doing plug in work. Um, so yeah, sample rate, whatever, whatever works for you is the best sample rate. The important thing is to not change the sample rate when you're making your bounces. So if you've recorded and mixed that 44 one, make your final bounce at 44 one. Don't, there's no point in, um, in increasing the sample rate as you're making your bounce. Now I'm going to contradict that a little bit in, in a moment, but, and you also don't want to down sample. If you've, if you've recorded at 48 K or 96 and you're sending it off for mastering, keep it at that same sample rate because the mastering engineer can handle the necessary changes. And for the most part, it sounds best to work at a higher sample rate. Um, but again, don't, don't, um, some of the worst sounding mixes I've heard have been at 96 K. Um, and some of the best sounding mixes I've heard are 44 one. So the sample rate is not your, um, biggest contender in my opinion. But I guess one um, argument people might have is that in the end, they're going to send it to a mastering engineer and then the mastering engineer is going to have to convert it to 16 bit for CD or, or yeah, bit, whatever. Right. So the argument there is keep keep it the highest resolution possible for as long as possible. Cause I'll tell you a little bit more about my process in a moment, but as far as the bit depth goes, this is one that people get confused about a lot. I get a lot of like, I don't get a lot, but sometimes I'll get a 16 bit file to master from and I'll ask, you know, so, you know, can't you send a 24 bit or a 32 bit float? And they usually say, well, we accidentally recorded at 16 bit. And I say, that's fine. That, that's not a big, that's not going to ruin your album. It's not the best, it's not the setting I would have used, but it's not going to ruin your album. You don't have to re-record it. But what, what people don't, Pro Tools kind of 
um, set the people up for this failure. Um, just because you record something at 16-bit doesn't mean the audio is 16-bit forever. Uh, in fact, the the mixer of any DAW these days works at floating point. So let's say you accidentally record at 16-bit all day uh, or all week on your album. The mixer, as soon as you do any digital processing, the audio is now floating point. And there's a free plugin you can get to show you this called Bitter by a company called Stillwell. So if you Google Stillwell, Bitter, it's a bit depth plug, bit depth meter. It's free because who's going to pay for a bit depth meter? It's pretty nerdy and boring. But put that at the put put that last on your master fader, and you'll see that. Um, so let's say you record a 16 bit file. As soon as you apply any gain change, any plugin change, the bit depth grows to 32 bit float, and in some cases now six, Reaper is a 64 bit floating point. So that's a long way of saying when you're done with your mix and you're sending out to mastering. Keep the sample rate the same, but I think it's advantageous to save it at 32-bit float because that's technically what your mix engine of your DAW is working at. Um, it's it's not working at 16-bit, so um, there is audio information there that if you save the mix file at 16-bit, you're you're discarding audio detail that could be um, useful in in, in mastering. Uh, eventually, it will be 16-bit, but. Um, you want to keep that process. You want to keep the resolution and and all that as as high as possible for as long as possible, and only reduce to you know the let the mastering engineer reduce to sixteen bit forty four one after even all of their work is done, uh, is what I'm saying. So yeah, because you're not going to be working on your session at sixteen bit, like you know you, you're you're working at the highest quality that the, that the artist gives yeah, you. Yeah, right? the moment I load that file into my mastering software and make any change, whether it's even if I just fade out the file, the, the digital changes are floating point. And this is a political topic, but I also upsample, and this is just for mastering purposes. If I get something in that's at 48K or 44.1, I will upsample it to 96 before I start. Now, the upsampling does not make it sound better because that's what I just said. Um, but I use a high quality sample rate conversion um, software. I don't let you know, Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, those don't necessarily have the greatest sample rate. They don't really have what I would call mastering grade sample rate conversion. You know, if somebody does a keyboard overdub at their studio at a different sample rate than you and you drag it into your session and it converts it, it's probably going to be fine. But it's not something you want to process your entire stereo mix with. Uh, most mastering engineers use Isotope RX or Weiss Sericon. WaveLab has good sample rate conversion in it. But the first thing I do is upsample, whether I'm going analog or staying digital, because I've done some tests, other people have done some tests. Generally speaking, I think the end result sounds better when it's when all the processing is done in a higher resolution environment. Now, yes, in a lot of cases it will be listened to at 44.1, but um, you, you can make a strong case that doing the processing in a high sample rate environment um, can sound a little better in the end. On, on one of the mastering groups on Facebook, a guy that I know did this exact experiment. He he took a mix that came in at forty four one, mastered it, then he up then he took that same mix, the unmastered mix, upsampled it to ninety six k, did the exact same steps, and then downsampled it to forty four one. And I think most, including myself, most people preferred the one that was mastered at the higher sample rate and then down sampled back down um, it's just it's kind of like if you're editing a photo you'd want to edit a photo from the highest resolution image in a high resolution environment um, and even though it will be reduced later i think doing that work and especially if you're doing restoration work if you're doing like noise reduction if you're restoring old recordings um, having it at a higher sample rate is I don't even think it's arguable at that point that having all that detail to work with just from noise reduction and, and all that stuff, a higher sa sample rate environment just sounds better in the end. So that's my personal take on it. Not everybody up samples, but I, I did some tests and that's been working really well for me, but that doesn't mean you should up sample it before sending it to mastering. You know, I, my, my short version is keep the sample rate the same. Um, and save it at the highest bit depth. Most, most DAWs will let you save at 32-bit float now. Now, you do want to be careful that you don't have a limiter on 
that is dithering to 24 bit. A lot of limiters have dithering built in. You know, um, you want to make sure any dithering is turned off. But if you check out that bitter plugin, you'll see exactly what I mean. The simplest test is to load in a 16 bit file. It'll read 16 bit on your meter. Change the level by a half a decibel, you'll see the bit depth grow. Um, it's one of those things. And in fact, in WaveLab, the sessions, you have to set the sample rate, but you don't even set the bit depth. It's kind of the bit depth doesn't matter in the sense that um, it loads in any bit depth, it does its processing, and then it's up to the en mastering engineer to say, I need 16 bit files, so let's dither and, and do all that stuff. So th I guess that's a long way of saying pro when you're starting a Pro Tools session and it says, you know, what sample rate and bit depth do you want? That's simply for the recording, like if you're recording files. That doesn't mean you're mixing in 16-bit. That just means when, when I record files, do you want me to record 16 or 24-bit files? And base, at, this, at, at this time, basically every audio interface is only goes up to 24-bit. You know, you can't record. Thir there are some, there's a Doesn't thing called sound. Doesn't Pro you do 32-bit flow to record? Uh, you can, but the interface, most interfaces are only 24-bit. So gotcha. you're... You could you can record a 32-bit float file, but there's going to be no information there. Are you familiar with sound devices? Yes. They they make those little. They're kind of good for location sound. Podcasters use them. That's where you're, I've started to see 32-bit um, analog to digital conversion, and what that's good for is clip it. Like if they have the, you basically can't clip it. So if they record it too hot, you can turn it down, and it's not going to be clipped or distorted um, but let's say you get a uad apollo a folk any kind of normal recording interface for a studio work they only go up to even my mastering converters you know the crane song head 24 bit is what they record at so i record everything in at 24 bit but as soon as i start processing it goes up to floating point so the bit depth again when you set that in a session it's really just for what's being recorded it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's happening gotcha. inside the session um so it's almost like you can kind of sum it up as saying when you're recording you know record at 24 bit and then as far as sample rate goes go with whatever your computer can handle the highest your computer can handle and then leave it at, leave it at that until it goes to mastering and then let the mastering engineer do their up sampling or whatever until yeah i mean i recorded many rock when i used to record and mix it was always at 44 one maybe looking back i should have did 48 um the only time I would do high sample rates is if I was doing like a solo piano thing for two reasons. One, you can really hear some of that detail more if it's like a, a sparse, a sparse thing. And two, I knew that if it was a sparse thing, I wouldn't have a b billion plugins on it in the mixing session that would bog it down. So it can kind of work. But if you're going to do like a dense pop rock production, I think 44.1 or 48 is just fine, and then it's going to help you when it comes time to mix because you're not going to destroy your computer. And now, at the time of this recording, you know the M1 Max are just starting to come out, and maybe that's less of an issue. But back in the day, it was a serious issue to try to mix at 90 a whole record in the box at 96k. It's take a powerful computer. Um, so yeah, I think that's my take on it. Is keep yeah. the sample right the same. No, that's great. Be, it's it's great to hear the like bit that depth. Process. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned Dither. And for people who might not know what Dither is, can you explain what that is? And, and should people be using Dither when they're mixing or mastering? Well, it's one of those things. It's such a subtle thing that um, there is, it is an important step, but you don't want to spend too much um, time worrying about it. It's basically, you know, Dither is basically a very low level noise that helps with when you're reducing the bit depth of something, if you're going from 24 to 16 bit or floating point to 24 or 16 bit, um, it helps with with rounding errors in the math, you know, quantization errors. And really, where you might hear this is in reverb tails when the level gets really, really low. You know, like a, the, the end of a song and the reverb fades into silence. Um, you know, there's probably been a million recordings where that didn't get dithered properly and nobody died. And they still sound pretty good. But if you want to follow best practices, just be aware of it. Um, ideally, you're just dithering once and dithering last. Because like I said, even if you... Man, it's hard to explain. Let's say like you, you're self-mastering and you um, bounce it to... 
and you're at 48K, but then at some point you have to reduce it to 44.1, that sample rate conversion is going to open the can of dither worms and require dithering again. So um, you really want to save dithering for last after all your fades. I mean, literally any digital processing as far as levels. Now, if you're converting a wave to an AIFF, that doesn't require dithering. If you are, uh, what else would it, was it good? If you're, if you're simply like trimming length off a file, that doesn't require dithering. But if you're doing fades, any plug-in processing, any digital processing where the sound is changing, that's all done at floating point. So you kind of want to save dithering for last. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but dither is really only necessary when you're going to be converting the sample rate, right? Um, not necessarily. Let, let's say that you sent me some 24-bit, 44.1 mixes to master. I say at 44.1. All my plug-in processing is increasing that to 64-bit float or 32-bit float. I still need to do their back down to 24 or 16-bit when I'm done with my work. You know, like I would do all my plugins, EQ, compression, gotcha, limiting. Because it pro- the plug-in then the, the limiter would be the absolute last thing after fades, after, and that's kind of where self-mastering can get you in trouble because you know if you if you re- if you bounce everything to 16-bit 44.1 and now you're doing cross fades and regular fades and changing sample rates, then it gets a little messy. And again, it's not going to ruin a project, but by following best practices from start to finish, it's all these little things that add up to something bigger. So gotcha. I think, I think that's attributed to like some of the, the better projects I've done and a reason why I'm, you know, getting more and more projects every year. Not cause I do, it's, it's not the greatest analogy, but just by following best practices and being really careful with the audio, you know, Bob Katz has a saying, respect the data, you know, just don't be sloppy with converting files without correct dithering. Cause you know, one mistake isn't going to cost you, but if, if it, if it happens a few times throughout the mixing and mastering process, that's where you can start to lose some detail, uh, you know, and again, one, one bad, one, uh, incorrect dithering mistake isn't maybe going to be noticeable, but once you start compounding that um, in the end, it might, it could, you know, it just might not sound as, as pure or detailed or open as if best practices would have been followed. So, I mean, I, in a perfect world, if you're mixing in the box, send a 32 bit or 64 bit float to the mastering engineer. Don't do any dithering. Let them handle it from there. Um, gotcha. If, if you are mix, if you are mastering yourself, you know, just be aware that even if you start with a sixteen or twenty-four bit file, any digital processing is going to increase that bit depth, and you'll want to, you know, consider at least dithering back down to twenty-four or sixteen, whatever you need. It, it depends on the distributor you're using and all that stuff. But um, I'm not saying it's not as important as some people. It's not going to make or break the record. Yeah. Again, it's not going to make it's not going to prevent you from having a number one hit, but just follow best practices and uh, things will sound, you know, yeah, as good as they can. And also it sounds like if you don't know, if you don't quite understand it, then maybe you're better off just not trying to do it either. Yeah. You don't want to overthink it. There's a, um, if you want to learn more, I'm sure you're familiar with Ian Shepard, but he has the mastering show podcast. He has a whole episode hey, about dithering and yeah, don't overthink it. Just be aware of when and when not to do it. And, for sure. That's awesome, man. Well, 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 Justin, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, thank you for taking the time to do this. If people want to learn more about you and follow you online or potentially even work with you, what's the best place for them to do that? Uh, probably the, the main studio website is uh, mysteryroommastering.com. That's, um, and right on that front page, there's links to all my social media accounts, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, and then right below that, there's some streaming service link so you can listen to like a playlist of stuff that i've mastered whether you use spotify or apple music title all that stuff um and and there's a contact form there's a project calculation form which lets you get an idea of what your project might cost and then the second part of that page is a way to submit it and all the details to me so i think mysteryroommastering.com is the best place to to get started and depending on what you want to do you know go from there Awesome. Well, Justin, thanks again for being on. And uh, yeah, I love the depth that you went into with a lot of these answers. I think anyone who is maybe unfamiliar with mastering or what goes into it or the software, 
um, I definitely feel like this is this is an episode that people are going to get a lot from. So so thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. No problem. So that was my interview with Justin Perkins, and I thought that was a great interview. I thought that Justin went into some really great detail about the mastering process and how different mastering softwares are different. I love all the conversation about things like loudness and the sample rate conversation. I think that he really cleared up a lot of confusion that some people might have about you know, what's, what sort of levels should you be mastering at or what sort of levels should you be mixing at and what sort of sample rates should you be using as well so that, you know, you're using the proper settings, whether you're going to be mastering it yourself or whether you're going to be hiring another engineer. It's really important to understand these things. That way you can make sure that you get the process done in the best way possible. So I think Justin did a great job of detailing a lot of those steps, and I hope that you found that very helpful. Now, if you did find it helpful, make sure to subscribe to this podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live every week. Uh, every Wednesday morning, we release new episodes and we've got tons of great episodes up ahead. So you definitely don't want to miss out. Make sure to subscribe to it. And also, if you can leave a rating and a review on the Apple podcast app, if you listen on there, that would be fantastic. That allows us to get in front of more people. And when people are looking for new podcasts, it'll allow them to know that you think this podcast is worth them listening to. So I do really appreciate it if you could take the time to do that. And if you haven't already done it yet, definitely make sure to check out MasterYourMix.com. That is a website where I help out musicians with creating pro-sounding recordings from their home studios. And I'd love to help you get your recordings to a point where you're super excited about them as well. So on this website, we've got tons of great resources designed to make the process super simple for you and to just make it very clear as to what you should be doing with your mixes, what tools you should be using, when to be boosting, when to be cutting. And one resource that you're definitely going to want to check out is called The Mixing Mindset. This is a book that I put out that became an Amazon number one best-selling book. And in that book, I detailed a step-by-step process for creating great mixes from your home studio. So definitely check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset. It's available at MasterYourMix.com. So that is it for this episode. I hope that you found it very helpful, and I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.